Hello and welcome to my channel. It's lovely to have you join me today and it's been so lovely to welcome many new subscribers. So a big hello to you all too. Unfortunately, I don't get the names of um, who's joined unless you um, comment and say hello to me. So a big hello and, and thank you for joining along. I'm a bit later than I wanted to be um, bringing this to you but um, yeah it's been a really really busy week. I'm wanting to share the weekend we just had along with some of the sewing that I'm doing which kind of intersects with what I'm going to be talking to you about with the weekend um, and yeah I want to get this out to you because we're going away again for a week on Monday so there won't be um, a chat for you next week um there'll be some coming after that but of course a bit of time off is what i need to a bit of downtime to respond to everything around me you know creatively i mean respond not responding to messages um respond to everything around me and yeah just get the old ideas flowing uh, at the moment my head is just like a busy filing cabinet of thoughts and ideas and i just want to put them into some sort of um order now, last weekend, so Friday, Saturday and Sunday, we, and by we I mean my youngest daughter and I, no one else would be as interested in what we were going to see. This is our own special trip, our project for our interests. And we went down to East Sussex and, and then on the way home, we came back via Kent. And it was what I called the Bloomsbury road trip, even though, a couple of people weren't part of the Bloomsbury group that we visited but people well one woman who's hugely fascinated me so I'll tell you where we went first of all we went to Farley's um, is a Sussex farmhouse and it was the home of Lee Miller the Vogue model of the 20s the muse and lover and student of Man Ray um, the wife of the surrealist artist Roland Penrose, a uh, British surrealist artist. She was a photographer for Vogue in Britain and she also went and took photographs of women working during the war in the UK. And as an American living in the UK, she couldn't um, take part um, within the war but she could photograph women supporting the war effort and um, obviously it shows the clothes that they wear and how they went about their work and and some models would have um, staged these um, these looks also and she also took some amazing um, fashion plates as well so after that she then became a war correspondent through the American army when the Allies landed in France and she went along with David Sherman um, as her assistant another photographer and they travelled up through Europe with Lee recording everything she saw from women that were accused of collaboration in France who had their heads shaved, um, you know, and you see the sorrow and the anguish on their faces. Um, whatever um, feelings you may have about them, they are harrowing images to look at. And further harrowing images are when she got to the camps and saw um, what people had been subjected to and, you know, the deaths and the horrors there and she recorded it all um, for the world to see sending it back with some of her um, you know captions you know that you know her writing back to Vogue um, there's a famous photograph of her in Hitler's bath um, where they'd been to Dachau that morning and they hadn't washed for days and they got to this apartment and they wiped the dirt of Dachau off on the bath mat, the muddy boots left the side. Hitler's photograph is propped on the side of the bath so you know it could be recorded where they were um, and they wash the dirt from the concentration camps off in his bath on the day coincidentally that Hitler and Eva Braun took their lives. The, the timelines all coincided in like this historic moment. 
um, Lee Miller came home she then got pregnant with her son and it said that you know now it would be recognized that she had PTSD from her war experiences and all that she'd seen and then suffered postnatal depression so the two together not a great mix and obviously um, not as recognized or supported at the time and she never photographed again she became a cordon bleu cook and she grew vegetables in her garden for her cooking and she amassed about 2000 um, cookbooks and that's where her creative energy and output went and her husband was a surrealist artist friends with many of the surrealist picasso was a friend who visited the farmhouse um, he moved on to becoming a curator of art that's where he saw his strengths even though he was a great artist so to go to their home was an absolute joy it was a guided tour um, of all the downstairs their son um, anthony penrose is still alive and just lives across the way um, but the house is as it was and in the kitchen you know we, as, as i said we went on a guided tour and the, the guide was so fascinating you know all the stories that she told us and she said patsy who would come in the 50s to look after their son and then just stayed for years you know for the rest of their lives so she became a friend too even after lee died she never threw a thing away so the cupboards are just full of all the spices and herbs she used and you know there's all her kitchen equipment it's a working kitchen and it was just lovely to be in that space and then to go through all the rooms where walls were painted in cobalt blue or the sitting room that was pale pink walls with olive green drapes and their artwork the photography about um it was just such an eclectic inspiring amazing home but a warm home in the dining room the walls were painted this particular shade of yellow that apparently was the color and she showed us the cover from farmers weekly with the yellow border and roland had asked the paint mixer to mix this exact shade um, to honor the heritage of it as being a sussex farmhouse and not far from uh farley's just across the downs you could see the chalk long man of wilmington he's holding two starves into the ground you know it's chalk um base all of the downs so prehistoric man or whenever you know a long, long time ago i'm not great on my early history um they'd cut these figures there's horses throughout england but the long man of wilmington is one that i've always loved you know used to um visit it a long time ago and they on a clear day could see the long man of wilmington from their farmhouse and that is celebrated in this amazing depiction within the ingle nook in the um dining room farmhouse um you know the dining room what am i saying um celebrating farming and the seasons and the the sun and the it's just incredible i wish i could remember exactly what the guide said but who wants me to tell you all of that you need to go and see it the place is incredible um and i've always been fascinated by lee miller but yeah my love affair with her and my fascination in this interesting strong vital creative woman will further continue now um there was an exhibition in um another sort of outlying building and we walked around the gardens which were really wonderful had a little chat with some sheep for a while in another field um and then we looked in the exhibition and it's to celebrate the upcoming film by kate winslet lee which is coming out in september and the guide said we are going to be inundated i think once this film comes out because a whole new audience will know about lee miller and then they they will come and visit which is great for the house and you know the longevity of you know it being there um but there were so many photographs uh that were stills from behind the scenes behind the camera and besides lee's original photographs and then kate winslet had also managed to source a exact replica of the camera that lee would have filmed through you know the old cameras i have got one upstairs my mum's old camera i think i'll i'll show it to you actually i decided with today's chat i 
wasn't going to sort of plan it out what I was going to say. I was just going to talk from heart. So that's why I haven't got the camera with me. But this was my mum's camera. It's a, called a box brownie. Um, and it's the one that she had as a teenager. And she would open the back here to put in your film. You'd hang it around your neck, but you would look through here to see out here. And there's a snap, you know, shutter button here but I love this camera I've always had it um I did play around with it when I was at art college and obviously Lee would have had a far fancier version of camera than this but she would have been looking through this screen down here to see what she's photographing over there Kate Winslet managed to find the same camera and film so she also took similar photographs as well as part of her recording you know it's a real passion project for Kate Winslet um, he was a real advocate for women I really admire and you know I was going to say love Kate Winslet, but of course I don't love Kate Winslet, you know, that sounds a bit girl crushy, but you know, I really admire her for, you know, the voice that she's putting out there and what she says. In the shop, I bought some postcards uh, for a friend who was going to write her dissertation many years ago on Lee Miller and then she um, wrote it on someone else, so I got her some postcards and things. Um, and I chose a couple of books for me. And one was this one, The Lives of Lee Miller by her son, Anthony Penrose. And apparently it was only after Lee died that he was going through all of the papers and the photographs all stored up in the attic. Things that had just been put to one side. That side of her life when she returned after the war was just stored and not revisited. And he found a mother that he knew nothing of. He just knew you know, Lee from his birth um, and who she was as the cook, but he had no idea of who she had been, you know, what she'd done and seen and the people that she'd met. And it's all collected into this book, which I've started reading, and it's just such a fascinating read. Um, and as a little aside, because I always love the unusual little stories, the human interest, and um, an uh, early lover of hers, he flew a plane and she was seeing two men at the time, this man Argyle and someone else, and she chose to go off um, aboard a ship to another country, I can't remember when, even though I just read it yesterday, um, with this other man. And Argyle taught people to fly and he was a pilot and apparently he'd flown past the ship dropping loads of red roses onto the um, ship's deck and then flew off, landed at the um, airport where he was picking up the student and apparently students would always sit in the front seat and this is what really fascinated me and it ends terribly sadly so it sounds awful that I'm sort of enjoying the story but um, you have the student in the front so apparently if they're doing something really dodgy when they're flying the plane the pilot behind could bang them over the head with the spanner to knock them unconscious and then take over the controls. I mean, that seems a bit extreme, but I suppose when you're up in the air, you've got to react quickly. So spanner them over the head. Um, but I won't tell you where that tale goes. Um, but that was a little insight that I, I gathered in this book, but it goes right through Lee's life. And so that was wonderful to get that. And then I bought a book I've wanted for an absolute age, Lee Miller and its fashion in wartime Britain. Rather than doing an overhead flip of these books today, um, I'm just wondering if, I don't think the ones that I was referring to um, with women during wartime in here, these are more um, fashion photographs, but styled, you know, in Lee's way. Um, and then you get to look at the clothes and everything. It's just a beautiful, beautiful book. So our next stop was to go to Monk's House in Rodmel, which is just further down, heading towards the coast in East Sussex. Um, it's the home of Virginia Woolf and Leonard Woolf, the home that they bought. And they kept their London house as well, but this is the home that they bought. And this is the National Trust book that I got there. Um, and this painting here of Virginia Woolf is the cover of My Room of One's Own, my copy of Room of One's Own, which she wrote at Monk's house. And there were rooms that were being built that the guide said these were being built as she was writing A Room of One's Own. Um, so, you know, it's just lovely seeing the process, but the house was just absolutely stunning. Um, and they are key members of 
The Bloomsbury group, who I have long been fascinated by. I studied Virginia Woolf at university, read all of her um, novels, and the stream of consciousness, I think, is a fascinating literary device, but can be quite inaccessible at times. You know, it's, it's not an easy flow reading, but fascinating. And by the stream of consciousness, I mean if, if you're not a literary um, um, student or whatever, because I don't want to sort of put you to one side if you think, what on earth are you talking about? But the stream of consciousness is how the, the writer would depict the inner working life of that character or the narrator, you know, the, the main protagonist on page. So you would be following their thoughts, the random thoughts we have depicted in the written word, um, which is a really fascinating device and one that Virginia Woolf is part of the modernist writers, James Joyce being another, and my favourite, May Sinclair, who sadly died young, so didn't go on to um, the great things that I think she would, but she wrote The Life and Death of Harriet Freen. It's a really, really short book. Um, but it's my favourite stream of consciousness novel. I used to love writing on these books. So you can see it's a passion project for me, visiting these um, people's homes. Um, and obviously the Bloomsbury group, like I say, have long fascinated me with their art and the people. There's so many notable people from that period of time all collected together in this group because through Virginia and her sister Vanessa Bell and their brothers, who then introduced their Cambridge friends, you know, all the young men from that world. It was just a melting pot of thinkers, philosophers, writers, artists, economists, um, probably more than I can think of. Um, so yeah, a fascinating group. Uh, a time in history, you know, where we're moving from the end of the First World War, the world is starting to change, women are gaining the vote, women are gaining greater freedoms. Um, the divide between the classes is um, easing slightly, but not greatly. You know, there's, there's so much change going on. It's a fascinating period in history. So anyway, I was going to show you a picture from inside Monk's house. It was an absolutely beautiful home. I have obviously taken photos as well, which I'll pop up. But this was the sitting room that you accessed from the conservatory. Um, you went down steps into the sitting room and the shade of green in there was just beautiful. Um, it was absolutely delightful. And Millie saw um, jugs of lavender placed everywhere and by a bust of Virginia Woolf. And she asked one of the guides, you know, is that a reference, you know, to her lesbianism in terms of the lavender being a symbol from Sappho, the poet, um, and it's also a symbol for lesbianism. And the reply was, no, it's just for the moths. You know, she laughed. She said, it's just for the moths. There's nothing more that can be read into it. But we like to think it was there as a, a symbol also of who Virginia Woolf was. Um, one of her notable big passions being with Vita Sackville West, who we did go and visit on the way home. So I'll tell you about her in a moment. Um, I think I'm going to slightly backtrack because I want to link this to clothes as well. Before we went on our trip, I got this amazing book from the library. I'm going to buy my own copy. And it's Bring No Clothes, Bloomsbury and the Philosophy of Fashion by Charlie Porter. And I was fascinated, absolutely fascinated from the moment I read it. It's like this all the way through, just amazing pictures with the writing. And the people he features in this are Virginia Woolf, Vanessa Bell, Duncan Grant, who was the artist who lived at Charleston with Vanessa, and also he was a lifelong um, gay man, but um, he did have a child with Vanessa. They had a very deep love and understanding and friendship. Um, Ian Forster is in here, John Maynard Keynes, who also um, came up to weekends at Charleston House where Vanessa Bell and Charleston Farmhouse where Vanessa Bell and Duncan Grant lived. And Lady, Lady Otterly Morell is in here, but also Grace Higgins, um, their housekeeper and cook is mentioned. And it examines how do I sum the book up? I'll, I'll read off the inside cover, I think. Why do we wear what we wear? To answer this question, we must go back and unlock the wardrobes of the earlier 20th century when fashion as we know it was born. 
and Bring No Clothes comes from yeah. Wolf's letter to T.S. Eliot when he was coming to visit and she wrote this to other um, visitors too, you know, inviting them to stay and she would use the phrase, bring no clothes. And if you think literally, you're thinking don't pack anything, but what she meant was don't bring clothes in terms of fancy clothes, just turn up in what you're wearing. We're not dressing for dinner, we're not upholding the old Victorian ideals of dressing for dinner. This is about coming to a place to be as you are, being who you are, um, without formalities, you know, we are free here. And Charlie Porter's book is fantastic. He's a fashion journalist, he's lectured, um, he writes. I find him so interesting. I want to go on and read more of his um, work because I love the way he wrote. Um, and he starts to sew as he's writing this book because he loses his mother and then his father. And he talks about the act of sewing as healing his grief and talking about how Vanessa Bell sewed her clothes and the clothes that each of these people wore and what it meant to them as an expression of themselves um, and how it helped them align tragedies or traumas within their lives or um, hiding, you know, for the men buttoned up in these suits, you know, hiding their homosexuality at a time when it was illegal, you know, trying to pass within the heteronormative world. Um, whereas you've got Duncan Grant, who loved to get his clothes off whenever he could. He, he was probably an early naturist. Um, and so he's always in various forms of undress, you know, didn't really like wearing a tie and wearing a tie was huge not wearing a tie was hugely frowned on the time he went out but within the world of Charleston in Sussex um, and their group he could be free to be who he wanted to be also um, and Charlie Porter explores all of this and sexuality and the heart of who we all are really um, and how we choose the clothes that we choose to wear and it's provoked a lot of thought within me about my relationship with my own clothes. I've not really been feeling it for a long, long time, I think a good year, that I struggle with what I wear. I look in the wardrobe and nothing pops out as thinking that's my favourite. Um, the dress I made to wear for Millie's graduation has become a favourite. I absolutely love that, but hot days, you can't wear high neck dresses, it's boiling. Um, I mean, you could, but I don't want to. Um, so I'm feeling my way through the type of things I want to wear. Um, it's also led my brain to thinking about a project that I'd like to work on. And so I bought various books as well that are examining this line of thought that I've got. So anywho, we did um, Monk's House um, and then we went to Lewis for supper and then we went on to our Airbnb, um, which was really wonderful. The lady there is a cinematographer and I think I can say this now because I've googled it and you can find out about this um, by googling it anyway. So she told me about the latest project that she'd worked on um, and it's a drama about the Mitford sisters that's coming out in March um, and she'd been filming on that and telling me a bit about it and I was hugely excited and thought oh I've got to keep it secret but then I've googled it and you can find out about it so. I'm not breaking any um, naughty sort of secret. Now, before I carry on about East Sussex, while I'm talking about my relationship with clothes, I've been exploring some new shapes. So if you see behind you here, is one of the Garni blouses that I've made for myself. I've made four for my daughters. I have talked about them here. I found, um, you know, a Garni dupe rather than drafting my own. And I thought I'm gonna make one for myself just to see, because it's a fitted bodice with a flowing, you know, puffed bottom. I love bows. I thought, what's not to love? And I've got this beautiful white fabric, but I made a placket to go down the center so that I haven't got skin exposed and my bra and, you know, a bit more modest. Um, and I lengthened it slightly and, and just did a few alterations and took a huge wedge out the back so it's not so poofy. Um, but I put it on this morning. I was going to wear it um, for filming. And I realised I need to make the placket because I hadn't tried it on, I just got on and made it. I need to make the placket wider because where it hits on my bust, it throws it back. So I need it to come over more. And I only did it for the top section to hide behind the bows. But then you've got the skin of my tummy exposed and, you know, it'd be like your jib. There's a bit of 
above the waistline so I need to take that placket out and make one to the bottom but that's the first part of me exploring um, new things and another thing that I'm doing I mean it won't look like a dress at all but I absolutely adore this fabric I've got a couple of things in this fabric and I bought some more because I just love the ditzy print of it it's got a vintage feel and I just really love it and I thought I want to make a shired dress my daughter's got uh, my eldest daughter Rosie's got a black dress and she when I was making it she said oh that's why when I was wearing it you were fiddling with it and pulling it around I was looking at the construction of it um, so I'm making a dress that will have a whole shired bodice you know down to the waist and it'll be a full skirt coming sort of mid calf and then these are the sleeves and they're elasticated on the shoulder so simple sleeve and then they're shired here that go into a ruffle I've done this before like my vampire's wife do um, dresses so um, they've got to be attached so look at all the shiring I've already been doing and I hope I've got there I might have to do another couple more rows but it's endless <sighs> yeah so shiring, it's a really simple dress to make, but you know, it goes on forever going round and round and having to keep winding all of that elastic on. So I'm getting there, but I want this to be finished before we go away on Monday, because I think it'll be a really nice, easy dress, even though rain is forecast all of next week. So we shall see. And I've also got a skirt that I've um, got to just finish hemming. This is for uh, Millie to wear. Um, and this was an interesting project. I copied it from a long A-line skirt of hers that elasticated on, made the pattern, well I just drew it on the cloth and uh, made it up. And then because this isn't such a give, givey fabric, you know, stretchy fabric as the other two skirts I made her, couldn't put it over her hips. So then I was like, oh, we've got to put a zip in the side. So I had to undo everything and I'd put pockets in where I haven't owned the other dress skirts for her. The other ones are really, really simple skirts. So I had to unpick loads and then change it to put a zip behind the pocket. And then I put elastic in the waistband, secured it behind the zip. So it looks flat at the front and elasticated at the back. And as I went to sew the zip in, I realised I hadn't got my concealed zip foot because my Juki sewing machine is in being serviced. I think I'm picking it up tomorrow. Even though I bumped into Tim who serviced it yesterday and he said it's all done and ready, but I'm picking it up tomorrow. He lent me another sewing machine to use, this lovely brother, but I hadn't got a concealed zip foot. So I think, considering I use a normal zip foot, that's not too bad. But now, when I get mine back, I think I will go on and just sew it in even closer because things like that bug me but I think it's quite like a, a Bloomsbury kind of print yeah that's what it reminds me of so back to Bloomsbury and I realize I mean this is going to be quite a long video I hope not too long but I'm not going to be able to do justice to everything in this video because believe me you could just talk for hours and hours and hours about these fascinating people but on to the Saturday morning. This was the thing that we were really, really excited about. Second visit in my lifetime to Charleston Farmhouse, the home of the Bloomsbury Group. This was the book I bought on my first visit in 1992 when they opened their doors. Um, they've been open for eight years. And when we looked around, this was the book that I bought in the bookshop, The Bloomsbury Look. Um, because I've got the other one and there were so many other books that I photographed that I want to buy as well but this is exploring I'm just trying to find oh here's Duncan Grant I think he's such a handsome he's a beautiful beautiful man there's Duncan Grant there and it's exploring their style and more about them and it's a really really interesting book so I bought that at Charleston in the gift shop there but Charles and we took masses of photos. That evening, we met an Instagram friend in Hastings for drinks. And she said, even though I've lived here for all these years, I've only just gone and seen Charles. I think it was last year or something. And we were talking about how you just take so many photos because it's overwhelming. There's just too much to take in. You then need the photos to be able to look at and say, oh, I didn't see that. Millie took photos. I said, I didn't see that in that room. You know it's just there's so much it is unbelievable and I felt the same as I did on my first visit to this house that the feeling of joy of creativity of passion somewhere that there's just an explosion of thought feeling freedom 
it's still held within that building. You can just feel it. If you stand still, you can feel it, you can see it. You know, everything is there that they created from the lampshades, the, the fabrics, the drapes, the wallpaper that they printed themselves, you know, the artwork on the walls, the sculptures, just, you know, all the furniture, they just painted everything, the doors, everything. And I can't remember who said it, it was a friend I was talking to the other night or my mum, but somebody said, I bet you've come home and you want to paint everything. And I was like, yeah, I do, but I don't know how it will go down. <laughs> but, but I do. Years ago in my marriage, we built a breeze block fireplace in uh, one of our sitting rooms and decorated it like the sitting room in, um, in like Clive Bell's study, the fireplace there. You know, we we loved to create and, and paint our furniture in, in a similar style. And I just feel that urge again, you know. It's such an inspiring place. And you go in the gardens, which are just beautiful hollyhocks that I'm six foot, they're double my height. You know, it's the explosion of colour. It's wild. It's There's paths, there's box hedges, there's dahlias, but it's not ordered. It's not formal, which I love. There's places to hide in that garden. There's a kit, cottage, you know, kitchen garden. There's a quiet area with uh, all broken china as mosaic. And I've taken some photos of that. Um, looking back up to the house, there's um, a pond which would have been bigger in the time for them to swim in and boat on. Um, there's just, oh, it's just an incredible, incredible place. Please go if you get a chance. The stories, I couldn't even begin to tell you um, all of the stories. I, I know I'm going to start writing my blog again and recounting a lot of this. I've been thinking about re launching my blog again because I'm always writing. I do um, my monthly sort of culture chats on my Patreon which covers everything like fashion history to feminism to art to literature to film, um, politics. It just all comes in. They're all of my interests. Um, one of my students who's also one of my patrons did say have you thought of doing a podcast because I think people would find that really interesting too. So it's just bubbling with all of these thoughts at the moment and the research and the writing that I want to do. So that was Charleston, um, not doing it the huge service, but just trying to give you a snippet. And on my Instagram, I talk a little bit about it as well. So you'll see on my feed a bit more. Um, we went to a bookshop in Alfriston that afternoon, explored the village and went to the first ever National Trust um, house, a medieval clergy house. But I'll just show you the book I bought in um, Much Ado About Books, The Point of the Needle, Why Sewing Matters. Again, a fascinating book which I've started to dip into. And it's about the arguing for the sewing's place in our lives. It celebrates sewing's resurgence, our creativity, um, our well-being from it and the sense of community and it's everything that my business Bobo Bun Sewing School and my patron Bobo Bun Sewing Club is about and it's just something I wanted to read further into. On Sunday morning we went to see the Dorothy Hepworth Patricia Priest exhibition in Lewis, Charleston Lewis and Dorothy Hepworth was the artist. They were both at the Slade but she was the more talented of the two. I mean she is an incredible talent. I'll, I'll put up some photos. She painted people in their village of Cookham um, along with still lives um, but she wasn't the person that wanted to go out and push her art. She just wanted to paint and her lifetime, lo her lifetime love and um, partner Patricia Priest had the confidence um, to go out and there's letters there where Roger Fry has written to her, but thinking that Patricia Priest was the artist. All the paintings are signed Patricia Priest so that Dorothy wouldn't have to get involved in the front of house um, work. So it's it's like a, uh, a dupe, you know, that it's like they're conning everyone, but it. it's her trying to gain her privacy. Um, as I say, there's letters to Roger Fry. He was a lover of Vanessa Bell, the artist, for a little while. Um, and Vanessa Bell writing to her, encouraging her to come to Charleston and paint. So they were younger than the Bloomsbury group, but they knew them. Clive Bell, Vanessa Bell's husband, who was an art critic and um, collector. There's letters from him. There's Dorothy Hepworth's address book with Vanessa Bell's address and phone number in there. So there's that little asides to their lives as well. 
um, and I was most touched by the painting at the end. Well, there's two photos that really struck me and I was really laughing on the phone to my friend and as I was laughing, Millie was getting up the photo and then looking at it in more detail and she couldn't stop laughing. And it's the wedding photo of Patricia Priest with the artist Stanley Spencer. And it's the most extraordinary picture. I mean, he's got a hat where the brim has started to turn down. His glasses are caught by the sun, which makes his eyes look like black hollows. He's got a friend by him. He's got a flat, cap, flat cap on and a stick. I, I'm surprised he hasn't got a whip it and a pint of beer in his hand. And he's got his arm around him, so it looks more like they got married. They're closer than the bride and groom. And then Patricia Priest, who married him, is towering above him. And Dorothy, her lover, is beside her glaring and probably thinking what the hell the reason they did it was because Stanley Spencer idolized Patricia he had her as his paid model but I think he also was reviled by her as well it was a weird sort of control type of thing and by marrying him they would be able to continue to pay their mortgage um but you know, it was never a marriage. It, you know, you have to read into this more. I mean, it's, it's utterly fascinating, but, you know, I believe these two women really, really loved each other. I think it was a really supportive relationship, despite other things that I've um, read about them. I think it was a really strong union. And seeing the last painting there, the self-portrait after Patricia has died, that Dorothy paints of herself, and the sorrow etched into her face, the loss, it was so poignant and she still signed it Patricia Priest, letting the world know really what had been going on, that, you know, she was the hand behind these paintings. So that was so interesting. And then we went on to Sissinghurst, Vita Sackville West's home. Um, oh, sorry, before, in the gift shop, I bought this book, Clothes and Other Things That Matter by uh, Alexandra Shulman, the once editor of British Vogue. Um, again, so interesting, going through each of the clothes, white shirts, um, sleeveless shifts, you know, and stories about each of those clothes. So that's really, really interesting. But as I say, then we went on to Sissinghurst, um, saw Vita Sackville West, writing room in the tower, just speechless. I'm also reading this book. I'm a real dipper in and out. I, I move between books and the odd book, I just lose myself. I don't do anything else till I finish that book and other books. I just keep picking up and continuing with them. So Behind the Mask, The Life of Vita Sackville West, and this is one of my favourite paintings of her, which we saw at the Garden Museum, the, the Bloomsbury artists um, at the Garden Museum earlier this summer. So, oh, just incredible, incredible journey and people. I'd love to be able to tell you more about them but we just don't have the time. I can't film hours talking to you, so I've just given you a dip in. Um, but if you want to ask me any more, please do. And hopefully all of my ideas will flow out into other ways, whether it be podcasts, my blog, a book, writings, um, you know, and following up with the sort of things that I sew and make. But thank you for joining me today and hearing what I've got to say and share and my enthusiasms and my passions. It's always lovely to be here with you. If you don't already, please subscribe. Um, it's generally knitting and sewing, but occasionally just some history and people who inspire me. Um, please comment away. I'd love to know what you think. Okay. Let people know I'm over here because more the merrier, of course. We love having people join us for the chit chat and watching and seeing and sharing. So until next time, it'll be, um, you know, a couple of weeks before I'll see you, I'm afraid, because I won't be filming. I will be in Yorkshire. So I shall see you again very soon. Bye bye for now.